guys, thank you for coming to the uh, panel. And I think that everybody else has introduced themselves already, but can we get a short intro? I mean, short, <laughs> short intro from you uh, since you haven't been on the stage yet. Thank you, Mario Katso. My name is Pekka Olikan, and I'm working at Business Finland, and I'm coaching it and wellness for your sake. I think that's enough at this point. Nice to meet <laughs> well, you. Well, that, that was really short. <laughs> okay. Anyways, uh, so uh, we had a lot of you on the stage already, but I am starting with this kind of wall of questions. So you guys have been talking about developing software and most of you have been talking about agile, things like that, but does it like really, really work in medical and other regu regulated industries? What's your take? Yes, no, maybe. And um, is there anything that you kind of think that is a major uh, stop or or major problem role now to be solved for it to work? Who wants to take first? We call it. She wants. To yeah. Take first. Uh, if I if I start. <laughs> yeah, you uh, can start. Yes. <laughs> yeah. As I said, uh, as I said in earlier, with Coronavilku, we were able to compare the dealing with Omaha and Coronavilku. So uh, when we are not using medically, uh, like the MDR based software, it's like the timetable is very different. Mm -hmm. We are able to react quickly. But um, uh, when dealing with uh, regulated things, uh, you really need to have, say, have more time to move forward and, and like, yeah. prepare for that one. I really loved your kind of uh, law-centric design because <laughs> that is sometimes what it looks like when you have to deal with some, something like that. Uh, can we get, like, I'm, I'm trying to poke you guys there <laughs> in the eye with some questions, but Nico, what do you think? After hearing all the other talks or most of the talks, what do you think? Is there hope for DevOps and Agile to really work together in medical? Or any other industry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think yes. Of course, there are. And actually, to clarify, we are already doing it. But just mm -hmm. uh, this, how should I say? We still would like to get further steps in utilizing automation in, for example, doing the verification and creating the result documentation and other very labor-intensive things. But I think the core challenge, uh, where I think there is things to develop more, is is like how to. Mm, meant together sort of agile iterative way of developing and then some sort of gate model that anyway will be needed if you are uh, releasing a medical product for um, mm. for treatment for example you need to communicate with so many external parties for example if for example any any manufacturing is uh, required and so on so it becomes our system delivery and I think that classic Scrum or even SAFE is not at its strongest in managing that when you are having complex network of different lead times from different uh, disciplines like R of design, uh, manufacturing, clinical, uh, and so on and so on. So I think it's not that could it work. Definitely it can and it is, but, but um, I, I think we haven't found yet the best position how to put together mm -hmm. scaled agile with multiple teams and uh, software as only one part of the medical device. Yeah. So you can't have like an MVP oncology <laughs> device, which is uh, like- You can, <laughs> but then you cannot release it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, like... And it would be really exciting if, if we could have yeah. some sort of mid-stage to simulate as much the operating environment so that we could say that, yes, this is the MVP. Of course, it's not good for clinical use. It's not good mm -hmm. for deliveries, but but definitely we would like to go there that the D for deployment in CICD would have like more and more uh, resemblance to the real operation environments. But then again, those tests that are eventually needing manual intervention, if you are dealing with images really acquired and actually acquisition process to put something into the something artificial like phantom water bottle to the scanner, acquiring an image and checking that this flow really works in practice yeah. really yeah. hard to automate usage of mr scanner if you need to set up the coils put in some sort of test target acquire images and so on and all with production software exactly anybody else want to take a shot of, the, of this question devops and agile 
regulated. Like Pekka is nodding there, so you. you look yes, there. I simply like Nico's point of view here that we would like to have kind of intermediate, some preliminary system. So instead of having a full clinical test, uh, we could uh, take a benefit of this kind of intermediate system, developing these ready to be developed and to connect to Omakanta. And when we have done this clinical test and testimonial for the patient safety, then we can connect that with full qualification, validation and certification in the national Kanta system. But uh, this kind of transform and the process, how to do this? It's somewhere hidden there. We haven't found the processes and the techniques. And it's simply the traditional case. We need somebody to take the first steps yeah. to show the road. And then we learn all how we can do it. But simply those uh, 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 software solutions that are basically capable of clinical testing, not all of those are yet verified for the clinical system, but they might be of benefit. So I simply like the Nikos point of view that we need to process on this kind of approaches. And RecOps is somewhere helping us how to go forward with this one. Mm. And as we see this at Business Finland is that there's a lot of companies outside of medical industry entering with their sensors and not knowing anything about MDR or IVDR. We have to give guidance for them. Therefore, we provide this, this document on how to proceed with this, but it's not the full story. And we need these companies, you, to work together. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I Nico was pointing previously about the, the new uh, IEEE standard that might come into play into this uh, kind of how to build regulated software, but then there is the hardware side. So, Tess, I know that you have some experience on different industries and also medical. So, do you have any kind of points to this question before I let the bargain glass <laughs> on the stage again? Yeah, I do. Um, actually, in, in 1998, 99, I was uh, in a project where we automated the full uh, factory for, uh, I think it was uh, microcrampers per mill um, for borealis polymers. Uh, with, we didn't call it AI at the time, but it, it's uh, AI now. It was basic. Uh, Bayesian model, and uh, what I and, and we had uh, microcontrollers at that time. What we are now calling IoT, and at that time they were just microcontrollers. So, so you're making us all look like we're old or something. Because yeah. I remember this time. Yeah. yeah. In my opinion, um, what what um, is is an issue uh, to develop develop further. Um, all these uh, agile systems is that we are doing it with wrong infrastructure. And in my opinion, we should move forward with microservices infrastructure in order to get the full flow of everything. And we can secure the systems as well. Um, of course, in, in prior Kubernetes and such uh, systems weren't as ready as they are nowadays. Uh, you can even uh, pull in operating systems as, as Linux SI. So basically you have all the uh, all your containers and such uh, in, in a mode where administrator access is not possible. And, and when you do this and, and you think about IoT and such, so why Google has, for instance, uh, killed their IoT platform? So I can uh, kind of figure out that whether they are moving forward with, with microservices uh, for IoT systems as well. And I, I think that it, it would be really, really great to look that card uh, for hardware systems as well. And when you do that to medical devices and such, then your patching processes and everything could be much more simpler uh, and centralized to, to manage. Mm -hmm. and, and you could actually 
get really, really, really low risk on, on, on the production as well, because microservices uh, are like amoebas. So when one thing um, falls down, it kind of refreshes itself that, okay, I'm putting that uh, instance there now. So basically what I mean here is that in, in perspective of cybersecurity as well, uh, when somebody tries to hack a system and, and they kind of uh, kill some instance. So basically what um, <laughs> this type of service does is that it, it recreates a new instance to the cluster. So basically, or new port to the cluster. So basically uh, you don't have the same risk anymore and the hacker goes with uh, mm. nothing. So that's that's something. So, so basically, yeah. So if I pull you guys together, it, it sounds like there's, the, the point is to treat hardware like it was software and keep it in very small kind of chunks so that you can actually test. So you would have like the software as a microservice and also kind of a micro hardware. Like I just have to say in, in our living room, there, there's uh, this Otsonator running <laughs> that yeah. is cleaning our masks because we have an engineer in the house, <clears throat> just saying. And what he has managed to do is that he has this kind of really micro uh, devices there and he has this software and he has the test and he can see immediately if something fails there, um, which it does sometimes anyways. But so <laughs> taking that same principle into the processes and kind of coming down from what, what Nico was saying from the kind of uh, faking, faking the, <laughs> the uh, test or doing some tests that are not with the real, real stuff, but uh, something similar. I think there could be something there, but what do you guys say from Barry and Jose and Bruno, any, any insights to this? Right. Uh, yeah, start. Yes. <laughs> you, go ahead, Bruno. Uh, the only thing, the only addition that I wanted to say is that uh, I only have a uh, uh, personal experience on software, so I I see the challenges on the hardware, but I don't want to enter that <laughs> uh, and the complexities. But on software only, I just want to. My, my feelings is that uh, well, we are dealing with computers, and somebody said that uh, computers are these marvelous machines that you can just build and you can eventually simulate whatever you want to in their even real case scenarios. So I have the faith that uh, by solving the engineering problem of having to have a compliance, uh, a continuous compliance. If it's the case of software only, we can just go ahead and just do it. If we only need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Right. Uh, anything to add, Jose? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this morning there was the discussion about how, how to bring this uh, fail fast attitude to of innovation to medical devices. So I think that in this, in this industry, uh, failing is not an option, right? We need to find ways to innovate, ways to make experiments in a way that is safe uh, to, our, to our patients, to our, to our clinical users. So I, I believe that there are ways to, ways to do a MVP medical device. You might not have the full capability. You might not, not have all the fancy functionality. Obviously, if the device doesn't fulfill the, the needs of the clinicians, then you cannot sell it, right? But mm. I think that we need to we need to try to find ways that not, not think that because it is a medical device is all or nothing, right? Is you either have the whole blown up uh, functionality or you cannot do anything. I think that there are ways, intermediate ways. And by modern, even if it, even if there's hardware, if you have a if you have a modern platform where you can uh, do updates over the air with signed binaries that you trust that whatever is being flashed over the air is what you what you wanted. I think that you can release a medical device and improve it by software incrementally later, right? It's not as easy as it is just a, a cloud-based product, which is not medical, but I think that we need to we need to be imaginative and go that way. Yeah, so basically make a Tesla out of it. That can be kind of improved by software updates. Or, you know, like video cameras can be very much improved by just you know updating the drivers sometimes like i found recently but uh so anything that you know 
it, it almost makes me think that what is the use of like virtual reality or augmented reality or you know any kind of like 3d simulations with this and, and yes please uh if you guys have any questions or comments, put them into the chat. We have time to take a few of them before we finalize this. But anything to my question about AR, VR, or any other uh, 3D simulations or anything? Anybody have, have tried them? With medical or other software? No. Well, maybe in the direct applicability in our field, but maybe they would be having a good promise in, in remote trading in these COVID yeah. tra uh, times, for example. Yes, you had something. Yeah, I actually have been fiddling around a little bit with uh, this type of industrial XR uh, sets, and, and they are pretty uh, good. And, and also, I, I think there will be some um some improvements when they are lighter and such so that there will be uh easier to for instance manufacture and, and apply all these compliance criteria in in hardware level as well and then we have of course in if you think about cybersecurity, we have also quantum computers i'm fiddling around with those technologies as well so everything as a uh, algorithm <laughs> type of uh, solution. So, so that's that's really interesting because I, I think that will, uh, for instance, fasten the hardware and also that you can run um, distributed systems uh, with hardware. So basically you wouldn't have single point of failures anymore because your device can actually um, be multiple devices, so to say. So that's that's um, something which is really really interesting uh, that I have seen in the market currently, um, or uh, coming to market so to say, and that they are doing testing for algorithms and such, and uh, doing the error correction in in medical industry as well. So I think there they there could be the next step before. Great, and. Uh Let's kind of come down to, let's talk more about medical uh, and maybe, I don't know if, if Sami wants to take this one first, but uh, is there any difference between different types of medical solutions? You, you were already talking about the difference between Corona and, and, and some of the other stuff that you have experience on, but if you can take that and if, if you guys can think about uh, that too, and if you don't have any other experience about medical than what you're doing now, then you can please compare it to what you were doing previously. So, but Sami, can you take this one? Yeah, from the coronavirus point of view, uh, actually, well, it is not uh, in any case medical solution because we mm -hmm. are do dealing with probabilities. But then again, uh, when talking with people, isn't aren't virus infections also <laughs> always the probability so it's yeah, not the binary thing. Yeah, it's always yeah. a probability when you use you know, AI for it. But yeah. I was intrigued when, when I was hearing about the uh, microservices because in a way of course coronavirus is like very distributed solution too because everything is happening to people's phones. We don't have any large backend huge mainframe calculating people's contacts. Instead, we are just sharing the keys and people's phones are doing the actual work, which means that even though they are like 2.3 million Finnish users and uh, which are getting the uh, keys from all over the Europe, we are able to handle that kind of load very easily. So, of course, uh, when dealing with medical things, I don't know, oh, this might be pretty far from it. Uh, in this case, we are just doing uh, using this with uh, exposure contact in, uh, tracing. But um, anyway, I, I think there are many things that could, could be learned from here. Yeah, I think that, that sounded, when you told the story, it sounded really probable. Anybody else want to take this? Kind of what are the differences? Yes, Nico. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point that came to my mind during Tessa's speech. Uh, that uh, some of the habits, for example, for security, dealing with cyber security, are actually rooted from the times when 
when you said uh, medical device, you meant disconnected appliance. Mm -hmm. And what we've been seeing happening is, is that this we will be having both uh, sides, both the sort of tiny appliances, of course, you cannot anymore think about that they are like closed room uh, type of implementations. Of course, you need to think about the connectivity throughout. You. But then there are in the other end of the spectrum, sort of very much coronavirus like very, very much hyper distributed solutions and everything in be between. So basically, Current, currently, nowadays, uh, IEC 62304, the central standard, mostly de uh, defining how do we need to deal with the regulatory side when developing actually the software and managing the life cycle, that actually stems from that appliance era. Yeah. It, everything is worded towards that goal that you are producing as something that can be held in, in hand or has a single installation and operated around single use cases. But then uh, I, I think it would be healthy to have this sort of um, view that also the other side is happening and then the things are meeting in the middle, that there are not, not just like appliances and distributed systems, but the things are coming together, of course, via edge computing and so on. And also medical use cases are so different that uh, you cannot really like copy the architecture from MR scanner or linear accelerator used, used in treatment to some backend system used to deal and distribute or facilitate any workflow at the backend. But still you need to be showing the compliance. So I think what, what is eventually needed is this sort of experience that how to deal, for example, with notified bodies so that you have a common language, because if you try to uh, express and, and uh, spell out your distributed system with terminology and standards coming from appliance era, you are going to be in trouble in audits and vice versa. So I think we, we need, would be nice to kind of reach more mature level of, of defining, for example, your type of architecture and this sort of architectural patterns that are present in your certain application area that, for example, you are uh, developing to, a, to be a medical device plus something needing really, really careful uh, coordination with notified bodies. Anyone else having this sort of experience? Anybody else want to comment on this? Maybe okay. the only thing I have to add is that uh, definitely there are different safety classifications and those are for a good reason, right? So based on what is the potential of harm mm -hmm. that a, a medical device a misfunctioning can cause to the patient, right? So if, if a pacekeeper fails, uh, the patient might die, right? So uh, unlike if a, if a patient monitor doesn't produce an alarm, well, you still have a nurse there, right? That can say, hey, this person is not breathing. Different stories if the person is not being in a clinical environment. I mean, that the person is monitored remotely and that's the, the monitor is the only thing, the only device that tells uh, is the person breathing. So there are different different safety classifications, and then of course there are different risk controls that you need to take and save. Uh, so I think that uh, you, need to, you need to very well understand what is the classification of your device to understand what are the controls that you need to put in place in your development process and when to engage with notified bodies, when to engage with regulators. But we need to keep also in mind that the safety classification of the device might change. So what, and it has happened recently for many devices with the new MDR, right? So you might think that your safety classification is class 1A and because the intended use change is slightly done, now you're class B. So are you prepared? Are you prepared to do all the extra yep. work, right? So it's a, it's a fine balance between doing the bare minimum so that you can get through your certification process smoothly because that's what you want, bring device to market and, and get people benefiting from your innovations. But at the same time, uh, be prepared for the situation when they, you, you might be up classifying. Right? Very much true, and, and thinking about the microservices and, and sharing the implementations between maybe different products to gain some synergies, then really, really good care needs to be taken that, that you don't kind of crossbreed uh, the, the things so that you are violating the classifications, or then you need to do a lot of rework that may, might be then just taking your synergies down to the drain. But then uh, this is triggering, triggering me a, a naive question, maybe then it's like, um, why do we, I mean, if we eventually want to build the best product with the best quality, 
regardless of the qualification. So why do we need to do less for certain devices and more for others? Agree, agree. So sometimes it's it's worth to say that okay, this belongs to class C uh, according to IEC 623 or 4, even if, if it would be something trivial, just to save uh, the time spent in regulatory actions, because then everything is the same. You don't need to give any like explanations that why something yeah. would be lighter than something else. No, so, so if we would have the right tools in a way that promote you mm -hmm. automate this additional work that you need to do, because basically eventually you need to do you need to do this you need to document the same things in a way uh, to be able to develop. Uh, you need to follow the similar software engineering practices. So. We are we are talking about a lot of documentation, and I call it rubber stamping many times because it's not real time. <laughs> and and well, one of the things um, as I have been working with compliance quite a lot um, with uh, automations and such. So one, uh, for instance, in factory instances when you have really really. Uh, high security environments where, where actually if, if your uh, product is, is working uh, not working correctly it the whole factory can explode so basically that that's um, a really really huge risk at that when, when you consider that so you need to be able to uh, prove back so basically when when you do something new so you need to all all the time uh, have uh, automated proof back. So, and, and that's one of the, the most difficult things to connect um, some of the regulations back that they actually work work real time, but it's, it's possible. But it, it requires a little bit different type of uh, infrastructure than, than we are used to use in, in a medical field, what I have seen. And as I've been also working with uh, some of the medical uh, certif certification and, and, and such as well. But, but there is a lot of similar things when you go to uh, analytical devices, for instance, when you are working with medical technologies for in, in pharmaceutical technologies and such. So if, if you actually fail something, if you calculate something wrong, so people can die because they get wrong type of uh, medicine, for instance. So you always need to be able to calculate back the, that it, it's actually proven that, that it, it works. And, and this is manual process mostly now uh, these days. So that needs to be, uh, if, if, you, if we want to get the real automation out of it, so we need to have the full chain and back. Yeah. There is no option of, of one way only. So. Yeah. I think that that's kind of going towards what I was going to comment that uh, it might be that if you're just starting the whole chain building, basically, if, if, if you're just starting out and you need to make something working and you need to reach some level of certification and, and regulations kind of support, so then you might want to go to the kind of minimum level because that's what, what you can do. But then when you're kind of more mature, and you have more more automation there, then what stops you from going kind of a bit more out there and, and go to the higher level, so to speak, because then it's not, not anymore a matter of time and cost because you kind of have that there already, but it might be the first first uh, situation with, with um, uh, building any kind of business pipeline you always have to start from somewhere and then you will get maybe like 20 percent cover coverage or 80 80 percent coverage might be in your dreams but it might take you some time to go there Becca, do you have something that you wanted to add to this well i could add some uh, challenges in this kind of environments and this is related for the data collection and when we are talking mm -hmm. about healthcare we need to uh, consider the ethics group uh, to get the ethical group permission on collecting this kind of health data. And regularly, we have seen in our project at Business Finland that it takes quite a long time before this kind of uh, uh, permission to collect data is granted. 
and therefore those projects uh, of two or three years duration may wait one or even one and a half year before they get the grant. And the same applies for certain, uh, certainly other fields of industry. You need to have some data collected for your machine learning or artificial intelligence or whatever it is in advance so that you can practice or train your system. And you need to have a kind of training data sets to guarantee that your input and output are within certain limits. And these kind of actions are something that are very difficult to regulate and to understand from the uh, notified bodies. And therefore, there is uh, solutions for healthcare that may take benefit of uh, AI or such systems are very difficult to regulate and make a type of conformance. The American FDA has put some writing on that and uh, they have a more practical approach. But at the process in Europe and also worldwide on global level is still going on. And this is one of the challenges we need to remember that we need to collect uh, training data and we need to acquire permissions from those we collect this data that we can use it for, not only for training, but perhaps also for third partner, if they set up their system uh, based on Corona Vilco to some other solutions that are based on this technology and training data that has been acquired for this one. So this is something we have learned. Yeah. And, and you are totally there. <laughs> it's it's uh, hard. I've been fighting with the uh, GPS devices in, in uh, I think it was 2006 when when we um, put this uh, DRT systems in place and, and taxi driver's location was revealed. So um, it, it's a similar uh, regulation. It, it took a couple of years before we got the actual approval. For, for that one from the regulators and, and it, it takes time in, in simple cases as well and, and with healthcare data it, it's much more um, longer it's more, it's more difficult and we need yeah. to remember that when we have this fast try fast and have these trials that we need to have this kind of training data available with permission so we can take benefit of that unfortunately we don't have on many fields, uh, on many clinical data sets available. Those we do have, they are considered valuable data assets. This is kind of knowledge economy. So the synthetic data yeah, is one solution. Can you start it that is fast? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do agree. If there would be actually more and more um, data sets to be used in R&D that could be utilized, for example, also for regulatory purposes, that would yeah. be a great boost for the whole industry. I don't know, I've been toying with the idea that could there be a way for using machine learning in artificially generating artificial sets. So that yeah. could be a one, this sort of really, really great common asset to the whole industry if there would be that sort of accelerator happening that before you proceed to have real live humans you could just create a population for your testing of course it's not yeah. the same thing but perhaps it could be close enough that you could get to this sort of mvp models and be assured that yes we are not going very very much far to the wrong direction and yes indeed they could be somehow verified data sets so that yeah. you have to know that that this is the stuff that if you use this, then everything will work. Hey, uh, so we have only a couple of minutes more time. So if there's like any last minute questions from the audience, then you put them in the chat now. <laughs> you have to wait for like next year or something. Um, so what is uh, the kind of final takeaways from all of this uh, that we have discussed today? 
it, it kind of seems like we have we are touching more and more, um, if I compare it to last year, we are touching the subject of data a lot. We are touching the subject of security a lot, going more and more to kind of microservices and maybe kind of modular things. And then we are also talking much more about APIs and medical <laughs> sort of, and, and uh, records this year and uh, than last year. So how would you kind of guys see the future? Like what is happening? during you know next year what are we going to talk about next year or what could be already kind of business as usual or or what are the upcoming next challenges anybody want to guess what's cooking <laughs> perhaps becca will start uh, yeah. i have seen something and have been talking in connection for the mdr and ivdr on the type conformance and the uh, May this year. Luckily, we got this one year extension of the transform period. And what I'm being talking with uh, Open Words is that those small companies that are not being capable of uh, getting their certificates through notified bodies and uh, or haven't got the personnel uh, for this quality uh, system setting uh, up their systems, uh, there might be a difficulty in Finland uh, uh, supporting our health tech export. And there might be these large companies that will go and shop those smaller ones, well, as the large companies typically have their uh, systems ready for quality system and this kind of reg ops. And I'm a bit heating up on the consolida consolidation of the health tech. And this may be a good issue or it may be a bad thing. I don't know, but it may be interesting to see uh, by summertime what's going to happen. Anybody else want to predict the future or raise up the topic? I think one, one interesting topic would be uh, like different standards that are actually having some overlaps, like 62304 for appliances, emerging 82304 for systems, what 60601 is saying about cybersecurity, and so on and so on. So I, I see that sort of phenomenon that uh, there are the sort of, how should I say, same but a little bit different wording on different sort of standards that, that you need to be able to be compliant with if you are releasing a global product. So how do we create this sort of baseline that, okay, this way of working, this sort of reference, that's okay globally. It, it can be uh, interpreted right by FDA, uh, CFDA, MDR, and so on and so on. This could be doable, uh, but, but the problem, it's not <laughs> problem is that all the, the standardizations um, parties and such, ISO and such, they have such an old fashioned way to deliver standards. They are still working with this PDF with red labels on them. And, and that's something um, I, I would really love to see the change that we could actually access APIs uh, that has the standardization models and we can use um, machine learning to learn what is the, uh, to do the automated mapping, for instance, between different standards and, and different regulations. I think I wrote something like this in 2016 already uh, when, when AI started to again come for uh, this type of uh, topic. But, but uh, yeah, we need to have more this type of uh, um, active data, not, not this type of old fashion PDF uh, type of uh, data. And yeah, you were you were actually yeah. missing that one chat discussion <laughs> that was going oh, I earlier didn't. today. Oh. Uh, I, I even mentioned your name, but there was like uh, the the discussion on on having APIs for for uh, kind of automated uh, compliance, and then there was this kind of discussion about. Uh, having ISO standards, for example, in, in uh, some kind of an API format, and actually Mitra, who is in, in one of the working groups, uh, promised us that there was going to be uh, some kind of like slicing up of, of some of the standards so that you can actually reference them at least like one uh, um, kind of 
one small um, I want, yeah, okay, we try to take you away. <laughs> the problem is that, well, I mean, maybe there is like some light in the tunnel, a tunnel, so, so that might be the direction that they're going. Anyways, hey, uh, thank you everybody in the panel. Thank you all the audience.